Here's the picture of the CPU that we had last time. We were interested in different functional units and how that enables parallelism. We briefly mentioned the instruction and data cache, but didn't say much about them last time. Those parts are the interesting part today. Uh, we're less interested in the functional units, so I'm going to refine this picture again to abstract it in a different way to talk about the caches, because in fact they're more complicated than that picture suggests. Inside the processor, and in fact inside each core, there's a set of registers. Each of those cores also has an L1 cache for data and instructions. Those caches draw from, uh, conceptually they draw from main memory. Right? Whenever you use a register, it comes from register. Whenever you reference memory, it comes from main memory. But before going straight to memory, there's a check in the L1 data cache to see if it's there. Or L1 I cache if it's instructions, if it's machine code to run. Uh, the reason that these are separate is because those have different properties. Uh, and data is not usually used as instructions and vice versa. So when you're in the normal circumstance looking for data, uh, we check the L1 data cache first. If it's not there, the search proceeds to an L2 cache, which is bigger and has more stuff, but is further away from the main work of the processor, so it takes longer to get things from there. The L3 cache is even further away, and in fact it's shared by multiple cores in a single processor. And finally, there's main memory, which is, which is consulted if it's not even in the L3 cache. So the reason that there are these layers of caches are that um, each one has a different cost and capability trade-off. And another way to draw the picture is like this from the book. Uh, registers and the L1 cache are relatively small and relatively fast, while main memory can be much, much bigger, but also significantly slower. And we could keep drawing this picture down to disks or even remote disks over the network. Registers, they're only on the order of tens of them. So uh, maybe tens times eight bytes. Um, but when you use a register in an instruction, you don't have to do extra work to get the value from the register. It's just there and part of the normal instruction execution. When you fetch from memory, then maybe, if you're lucky, it comes from the L1 cache. Uh, L1 cache sizes currently are around uh, tens of thousands of bytes. And you can get data from an L1 cache in just one cycle. If it's not there, you have to go down to the L2 cache. Those are on the order of hundreds of kilobytes, um, but it takes 10 cycles or so to get something from an L2 cache. The next layer is L3 cache, where caches are on the order of megabytes, and it takes on the order of multiple tens of cycles to get values. Main memory, of course, is in the gigabyte range, or maybe even a dozen or two gigabytes, um, but getting from main memory uh, costs hundreds of cycles. And if you're going to the disk, it can be hundreds of gigabytes and many more cycles. And going across the network, you can have arbitrarily large, arbitrarily many disks, but it can take many, many more cycles to send network packets. So that is uh, the picture of the trade-off. You can get a small number of things quickly and lots of things if you wait longer. And in fact, the trends on these things have been that the CPU uh, is not only faster than memory, and disk and so on, but it has gotten faster more quickly than the other things have. So the problems that we talk about today are unlikely to go away anytime soon, and for quite a while they have been growing, and this topic, this this issue of caches, and uh, related to related performance issues relative to the CPU has, has been quite important.